We've come to Section 10, Grounding and Bonding. Let's go through the changes for 2015. This slide and the following three slides provide a review of grounding and bonding. Rule 10-002, Subrule 2, speaks about the object of grounding. Views on grounding have changed considerably over the past few years. Testing shows that current generated at the time of a fault on a grounded system travels mostly through the bonding path and then through the system's grounded service conductor, the neutral, to the transformer point. This is why Rule 10204, Subrule 2, requires a grounded service conductor to be run to each individual service if the utility service is grounded, even if the equipment supplied does not require a neutral conductor. Rule 10-812 was changed to require a minimum number 6 AWG ground for this reason. The grounding conductor's purpose is now to provide a means to connect the earth to the electrical system's bonding path and minimize any voltage difference between the equipment and the earth. A shock hazard is created when there is a voltage potential between two points. When equipment fails and a fault occurs, the metal parts of the equipment carry the fault back to the power supply neutral. As this fault current flows, there is a voltage rise across the metal electrical equipment. Good effective bonding provides a low impedance path which results in a low voltage rise, reduced risk of electrical shock, and faster operation of the fuse or circuit breaker and less equipment damage. Rule 10-002 speaks of using an ungrounded system. Ungrounded and neutral grounding schemes are often installed when some industry processes cannot be interrupted. Usually found on larger installations, qualified electrical maintenance staff will monitor and respond to ground fault conditions prior to a large system fault occurring. 10-106 AC Systems Subrow 3 was an Appendix B note in the 2012 Code Edition. The note was moved to Section 10, making compliance a mandatory requirement. Acceptable locations should be determined based on the type of occupancy or use and where those responsible for monitoring the status of the system will normally be situated. It is important that the location of the system status monitoring equipment be located where the person responsible will receive the notification and that the responsible person understands the situation and the consequences of ignoring the warning signal. 10208 Subrule 2 is new and requires that buildings housing livestock have their neutral and bonding circuits isolated from each other. Grounding the neutral at a building is no longer permitted. This means barns and similar structures supplied from a distribution system located elsewhere on the property shall be supplied with a feeder incorporating a bonding conductor and the neutral bonding screw shall be removed. Stray neutral voltages are well known to exist and can affect cattle and other livestock in barns and milking parlors. These stray neutral voltages are often referred to as tingle voltage. A tingle voltage problem, as small as 0.5 volts, can severely affect livestock and result in reduced milk production, skitterish or nervous animals, and lack of appetite all leading to chronic health problems. Regrounding the neutral conductor might contribute to the tingle voltage effect. Rule 10208-1B requires provisions for a bonding conductor when supplied from another service using an overhead feeder. To comply with Rule 10208-2, an overhead feeder or branch circuit supply will require a bonding conductor to be brought from the main service. When a standard triplex or quadruplex does not provide the required number of circuit conductors, installing a separate bonding conductor in accordance with Rule 12308 and 4008 will be acceptable. The neutral conductor must be grounded in compliance with Rule 10106, where a barn or livestock building is supplied by its own main service and supplied by the utility. Rule 10802. The amended rule is written in preferential order. The grounding conductor shall be copper, but when installed in dry locations, it may be aluminum. Subrule 3 allows materials other than copper or aluminum by special permission. 
However, SUB Rule 4 states that regardless of the grounding conductor material, it shall have corrosive resistant properties or be protected against corrosion. Aluminum is not acceptable when connected to a ground plate electrode, which is direct buried. It cannot be used as a for ground. It could be used when an in situ grounding electrode, such as a cold water pipe, is selected. Aluminum would be acceptable in a building where transformers are installed on several floors. And again. Aluminum would be acceptable in a building where transformers are installed on several floors. Let's remember Rule 2-024 when using aluminum as a grounding conductor. All fittings must be approved. Rule 10-814, bonding conductor size, has been edited to recognize that larger installations use solid bus bar applications as the system conductors. Table 16 has been revised and separated into two tables, 16A and 16B. Table 16A is used when the installation consists of wire and cables. Table 16B is used for bus bar installations. Rule 10.814, Bonding Conductor Size, Sub Rule 3, provides direction for selecting bonding conductors when circuit conductors are paralleled. The sub rule has been edited to separate the two types of installation methods. Bonding conductors selected using Table 16A are based on circuit conductor size, whereas bonding conductors selected using Table 16B are based on the ampacity of the bus bar installation. New Table 16A now specifies the size of the largest ungrounded conductor. The table has been separated to provide separate copper and aluminum wire references. The bonding conductor sizes have been slightly revised to correct for ampacity adjustments to some conductors. The size of the ungrounded conductor is now capped at 2000 kcm. Table 16B provides the minimum size bonding conductor for use as a system bonding jumper. Table 16B also provides the minimum size bonding conductor required when bus bar is used as the wiring method. The ampacity of the bus bar installation must be known before selecting a corresponding bonding conductor. The table is further divided into columns when using the bus bar or bonding wire. This slide illustrates the correct table to be used for the installations depicted. This rule was formerly titled Grounding Conductor Connection to Water Pipe Electrodes. The title and scope has been changed and this rule now applies to all electrode types. Former Subrule 3, found in the 2012 code, has been located into Appendix B as notes. Subrule 3 describes how the cold water system was to be bonded and made electrically continuous. That's it for Section 10. Thanks for watching.